Hello, I'm Cyril Vanier. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, breathing new life into BRICS. The group of emerging economies is expanding and aims to challenge the dollar's dominance. Can the bloc rebalance the world order? Also this week, the Global South is betting on BRICS. We'll be taking a look at why developing countries are increasingly interested in joining the club. And an olive oil crisis brewing. It could affect almost every household in Southern Europe, but Middle Eastern nations see a business opportunity. They are diverse, growing economies with big ambitions. BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa have long complained about Western influence over global financial institutions and trade, and they want to counter that dominance, championing developing nations in order, they say, to rebalance the world order. In a push to strengthen its global power, the BRICS group agreed to add new members to the alliance during its annual summit in South Africa. The group invited six nations, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Iran, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Argentina, to join BRICS. The BRICS summit was held after the U.S., Japan, and South Korea agreed to expand security and economic ties. Before we go any further, a refresher course on what is BRICS. The acronym was coined by former Goldman Sachs chief economist Jim O'Neill back in 2001. It started actually as BRIC, which grouped together four of the largest and fastest growing economies at the time, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Well, the quartet ran with the idea Later, they invited South Africa to join, and that's when BRIC became BRICS. The grouping relies on the combined economic power of its members to counterweight Western forums, such as the G7, the group of seven advanced nations. BRICS nations represent 42% of the world's population, just above a quarter of global gross domestic product and a fifth of all trade. Their total GDP in purchasing power parity terms is actually bigger than that of the G7. BRICS represents 32% of global GDP compared to just under 30% for the G7. And despite that, BRICS gets only a fraction of the voting power at the International Monetary Fund. BRICS nations want to change that imbalance by creating an alternative to US-led financial institutions. They have founded the New Development Bank, which has approved more than $30 billion in loans since it was set up in 2015. Compare that to the World Bank, which committed more than $100 billion in 2022 alone. BRICS also aims to reduce reliance on the U.S. dollar. Member countries are worried that Washington could weaponize the dollar through sanctions. So BRICS members are increasing trade in their own currencies. They've even considered creating a BRICS common currency. But... Critics say that the group's internal differences could hamper its plans. Example, India and China have a simmering border conflict. And while Beijing and Russia are rivals to the U.S., well, you've got India, South Africa, and Brazil, which all want warm relations with the West. Let's talk about all of this with our guests. Well, from Barcelona, Flavio Camim joins us. You're an economist and associate professor of economy at the Ramon Yul University. From Shanghai is Karine Costa Vasquez, a non resident senior fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Welcome to the program to both of you. Uh, Flavio, let's start with you. The BRICS organization has often been criticized as just a talk shop and somewhat ineffective, right? That criticism is out there, but they've just taken a big step and agreed to expand to quite a few, uh, to, to quite a number of countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia is on the list. Argentina is on the list. We'll talk about them more specifically a little later. Uh, Iran as well, Egypt. What do you think? Still ineffective? Um, what, what I would say is that... Um, um, nowadays, uh, and especially after this last meeting, we can see a much more political drive to BRICS than we have seen before. It has always been there, uh, it must be said. But in terms of the money, and we have to follow the money, what we have seen is that the political intentions, they are moving ahead of the economic intentions. So there has been some collaboration. There are some plans. We have the banks uh, at the BRICS Bank, and there are some initiatives. But in terms of the economic potential of the countries, when we see the kind of values, the kind of figures they are, they are managing, 
Uh, well, they are not terribly uh, impressive, I would say. So, uh, but politically, because different countries they have different political demands uh, in this kind of global um, discussion. So, uh, it's sort of fulfilling uh, its promise, and I would say that now more than ever. Karen, your thoughts on BRICS expansion? If I may, Cyril, I would like to challenge your question, your initial question, and then uh, follow up with uh, right my ahead. thoughts on the expansion. Uh, my sense is that uh, the BRICS has delivered quite a few uh, initiatives. And actually, if we look uh, over these past 15 years and 10 of them, I've been living and working with uh, many of these countries, uh, we actually see some very concrete initiatives that have been delivered and, and just to mention a few, the New Development Bank, the Contingent Reserve Agreement are, are some of them. Uh, it's true, though, uh, that over the past uh, four years, five years, the, the BRICS as a bloc has found itself in a difficult situation, uh, in a stalemate because of uh, political and economic uh, changes within the countries, uh, within countries in the bloc, and of course, not, not to mention uh, the geopolitical context uh, that drove uh, the, the bloc into, into a stalemate or a paralysis, uh, so to speak. Uh, and therefore, many criticisms over the effectiveness of the bloc uh, uh, arose, and, and these are very legitimate. Uh, but my sense is that as we close a, a, a third five-year cycle of the BRICS and are about to begin a new one, uh, what we see is that the BRICS has reached maturity over these 15 years. Uh, and the expansion is an example of it. Uh, the expansion not only to bring new members to give traction to many of these initiatives, including uh, those that I've mentioned, uh, but also to strengthen uh, the, 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 the main demand from the BRICS and which actually uh, 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 gave, uh, motivated the, 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 the creation of the block back in 2009, that it's precisely creating a more representative a more just uh, multilateral system. So as we give this next step forward, initiate another five-year cycle with, uh, as we call the uh, a larger BRICS family, uh, I think we are now ready to, to gain a new impetus and enter a new momentum at a different uh, level. Okay, so let me take it back to Flavio then, because you were suggesting, hinting, Flavio, that the BRICS, in your view, have been a little disappointing um, and, and ineffective uh, since they were launched. The fact is that there are an increasing number of countries from the Global South that want to join them, as we've just seen. So how do you explain that? Well, first, to, um, to emphasize my point, I think um, all BRICS, they have um, very serious social challenges. We, we, we cannot ignore that even China, although uh, its progress has been uh, remarkable in terms of poverty reduction, still doesn't have inequality issues there. And um, what can we talk about? Um, what can we say about India? Uh, although they are celebrating going to the moon now, if we use some um, MPI, multidimensional poverty index, so roughly half of the population would still be classified as poor. And in terms of Brazil, that remains a structural challenge and South Africa is just the same. So I think one thing is what kind of development we are promoting in terms of BRICS. I think the, the illusion that economic growth by bringing together markets uh, that might solve the problem. This has been for, criticized for at least the last 50 years, and we have plenty of evidence to look at this situation or at this scenario with some um, um, suspicion. Uh, on the other hand, it's true that many countries are interested uh, in, in joining the group, perhaps with the hope that that might facilitate some access to resources. Many of these countries, they don't have much to look forward in terms of new promises for development. So perhaps believing that common markets and whatever can be facilitated in terms of deals and agreements might provide a fresh start for them. So um, uh, we could consider that uh, their, their main motivation. Different countries, they might okay. have different motivations. 
Oh, but but anyway, so uh, one should be critical of uh, what the concept of development is driving their uh, initiatives. Let's talk a little bit about the specific issue of de-dollarization, because this has been a big push by BRICS countries. So let's look at the numbers. The share of the Chinese yuan in, yuan in trade finance has more than doubled since Russia invaded Ukraine. So look at the numbers. It rose from less than 2% back in February 2022 when the war started in Ukraine to 4.5% a year later. In comparison, the euro accounts for 6%, the Japanese yen less than 2%. But while the greenback, the dollar, remains king, 84% of trade is done in dollars, its share of global reserves is falling. The IMF says that it was at 59% in 2022. That is the lowest point since data was first available in uh, 1995. All right, let's go back to our guests. Um, Karen, do you think the danger is in any, the, I beg your pardon, the dollar is in any danger of losing its spot as the king currency? My, my first uh, point is that uh... We've we've seen uh, several economic cycles. The U.S. dollar is just one monetary standard that we have. We had the 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 pound. We had the gold back uh, back in time. Uh, so I think the the one certainty is that 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 we have is that at some point another currency or a basket of currencies or some other uh, uh, product or uh, uh, will be uh, will become. Uh, the new uh, pattern, uh, right? Uh, so, so this is this is my first point. My second point is that uh, the BRICS are not pushing for de-dollarization, for uh, reduction in the influence of the U.S. dollar or mm. any other currency uh, in the world. Uh, as I pointed in my in my first uh, answer, uh, I think the the whole motivation for creating the BRICS is offering options. Okay, we are looking at the two different sides of the coin, but the intentions uh, uh, say a lot of uh, what are the main motivations driving uh, the forces uh, within these countries. And for the BRICS, uh, one of the options they are seeking with uh, a local currency transaction in local currencies is precisely to facilitate trade, uh, to reduce trade costs, to increase access to markets, to reduce exposure to exchange rate volatility and taking... Corinne Flavio, stand by. I want to inject something else into this conversation. The Brazilian president has criticized the IMF, saying that it is suffocating economies. We want to have a look at the case of Argentina, which is among countries invited to join the BRICS group. It has recently paid its IMF debt in yuan after a currency swap deal with China. The country is facing its worst economic crisis in decades, with an inflation rate topping 100 percent and a growing poverty rate. The front-runner far-right presidential candidate in Argentina, Javier Milei, wants to change how his nation does business. Fintan Monahan reports. Anger and frustration with Argentina's political class runs high in Buenos Aires. Horatio is a retiree. He says his $200 a month pension isn't enough to live on. We cannot buy, we cannot eat. A kilo of potatoes, a sweet potato, a tomato is unaffordable. How do we live? We cannot live like this, and worse if you're retired. I know people who line up in banks to beg for a loan. It's sad. Inflation has been over 120 percent this past year. People are demanding solutions that will bring stability to the economy. Economy Minister Sergio Massa is running for president. He believes the answer may be moving closer to China. Argentina applied for membership of the BRICS bloc, which seeks to move away from the domination of the dollar. And it recently paid its international debts in Yuan after a currency swap deal with China. El Banco del Pueblo Chino y el Gobierno Chino the Chinese People's Bank decided to expand the use of the swap that Argentina has with the Chinese government, allowing us an additional $1.7 billion to complete today's payment of $2.7 billion. But his challenger has a different vision. Javier Mille calls himself a libertarian. He wants to drastically downsize the government and fully link the economy to the U.S. dollar. Politicians are not the solution. They are the problem and they don't want to apply the solution of the ideas of freedom because it is against their interests. So if they don't want to change, let's get them out for good. 
Mile has benefited from disillusionment with the establishment. His supporters hope he can turn the country around. I went and bought $100 yesterday so I could save. Nobody can save here, so I sold them again. I hope there is change. Come on, Mile. Argentina's voters want inflation under control and a more stable economy. But will they choose to move away from the dollar or embrace it completely? Vincent Monaghan for Counting the Cost. Karen, what do you make of the Argentina case? On a surface level, it does seem to suggest the, the, the dependence that the world still has on the U.S. dollar. It's a clear example of, of the options that the BRICS might offer to Argentina to help the country overcome uh, some of these challenges, right? I'm not saying uh, the BRICS is a silver bullet. It will fix all uh, the problems of Argentina, but certainly it has uh, some very concrete platforms uh, that can be extended to Argentina now as a, uh, as a, as a member uh, of the bloc starting next year. Uh, to help overcome. And the first one is the, the new development bank. Uh, well, uh, considering that Argentina will formally apply to join the bank uh, as a member of the BRICS bank, it could take infrastructure investments to help unlock some of the bottlenecks, uh, infrastructure bottlenecks uh, for economic growth. If we take uh, another BRICS platform, the contingent reserve agreement uh, that was created uh, in the same year as the NGB, Argentina could take uh, 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 resources uh, to help address uh, the, the liquidity issues uh, that it has been facing. The contingent reserve agreement which uh, was created actually to function in a very similar way as the IMF uh, currently does. Uh, and I think a third platform which uh, has is being discussed and has been approved uh, uh, by the BRICS countries uh, this year is the creation of mechanisms to settle transactions uh, in local currencies and possibly even the creation of a unit of account uh, using the, the currencies of the five original members. Uh, and such payment system, if, if it's launched, it could be another option for Argentina to settle its commercial transactions without the need uh, for dollars. So, so these are some of the very concrete ways how uh, membership uh, to the bloc could potentially help Argentina beyond other uh, spheres, uh, other than the political, uh, sorry, other than the economic uh, arena. Okay, that's really interesting. So in that case, we'll wrap up this conversation with you, Flavio. We've, we've talked about all of this expansion, de-dollarization, these alternatives that Karen has mentioned. Where it, it, the sum total of all of, all of this is what, uh, as relates to the BRICS? Where do you think this leaves the BRICS? I think uh, it leads the BRICS to play um, um, an important role in terms of geopolitics, an important role in terms of uh, putting together different demands for international relevance that countries have. It's true that some of these institutions put in place and some of these mechanisms might help um, countries in some specific issues, but the bigger issues, which I would say, they are development issues, issues related to poverty, to inequality, to, um, to fixing even socially the social tissue of some of these countries, such as the case of Argentina. I don't see how, how BRICS would be a solution for so many countries. They might get something out of there. Yes, this is true. But this is um, a long way, uh, a long run for, for these countries. So uh, what I would say is that is of more political relevance than of economic uh, relevant, sadly, and even economically. Economically, this will not fix some of the problems that we have seen, such as in Argentina uh, or many other countries that want to join BRICS. Flavio Comim, Karin Costa Vasquez, thank you so much for joining us on Counting the Cost today and for your expertise on this BRICS topic. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Olive oil is a top choice for many chefs and home cooks, but the staple is not just an essential component of the Mediterranean diet. It is as much culture as food and a symbol of regional identity, particularly in southern Europe. However, due to unusually dry weather and sky-high prices, olive oil lovers may have to start pouring less of it into the pan. Scorching temperatures in Spain, Italy and Portugal, which are all leading producers, parched olive groves last year, and the harvest season is expected to be slashed this year as well. 
The shortage is likely to push prices further up. They've already hit an all-time high of $8,500 per metric ton earlier this month. That's almost 10 times a metric ton of crude oil. European producers turned to Middle Eastern countries to fill the gap. Tunisia, the Arab world's biggest olive oil producer, and Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey are among nations seeing unprecedented demand. Ankara suspended the export of olive oil until the harvest season in November to help ease prices at home. It's also rolled out a tax of 20 cents for every kilo exported abroad. Joining us from London is Kyle Holland. He is oil seeds and vegetable oils analyst at Mintech. Kyle, how bad is this for Europe's olive oil industry? So I think to kind of ascertain and kind of answer that question fully, we need to rewind back to, to 2022 a little bit, where across the key growing periods for, for olive trees, it was extremely dry and very much a lack of soil moisture. And the trees began to suffer significantly. Um, the trees produced more or less no fruits or less fruit in some cases. And this was a key issue in Spain, the lion's share produced and exported olive oil, but also in other key areas of the Mediterranean as well. So looking at that, effectively, that, that is where things started to sort of take a downward turn according to market fairs we speak to here at Mintech. The uh, Spanish production was only 610,000 metric tonnes compared to usually 1.3 to 1.5 million metric tonnes, mm. roughly a decrease of 53% year on year. How much higher do you expect prices could go? That's a difficult question. Um, the, the current situation is that because of the lower production and the drawdown of volumes over the season, Spain, as I mentioned, the key producer and exporter of olive oil, is running very low indeed on volumes um, left before the before the new harvest. So the new harvest in Spain starts roughly September, October and runs into the following year. So roughly ends February, March. And with the current supply in the hands of manufacturers, it is possible looking at pure, at pure mathematics, should the drawdown of these levels continue, that Spain runs out of olive oil completely. Um, there is no olive oil left in Spain, not just good qualities, but all olive oil. So as a consumer of olive oil, as so many of us are, including Spanish olive oil, I listen to you and I think, well, maybe I should start hoarding. And other people who listen to you will probably think the same thing, but that would only make things worse. Yes, I, I think that would certainly be the case. The, the Spanish uh, players and players more generally, I think to kind of allude to, to you know, a wider kind of schematic, have been going to other players to seek for olive oil. And this is not unusual if, play, if players think Spanish prices are too high, they usually see uh, supply from Tunisia, Morocco, um, these kind of areas, Turkey as well. But the problem in Spain has been so significant, the, the low volumes produced, the volumes uh, naturally shrunk throughout the season, that even going to these areas has been problematic because the prices for Turkey olive, Turkish olive oil and Moroccan olive oil have gone up as well for Tunisia. Mm. So the, the concern is that with the, the poor harvest that could come not just for Spain, but for the wider EU, that these problems are going to continue. That, that, that's, that's the big concern, that this is not a one-off. This is now a continuation of a poor harvest that some say we speak to can't really afford to happen again. So far, those countries that you mentioned, whether it's uh, Turkey, Morocco, Tunisia, haven't been as badly affected as Spain. How come? They have a slightly different breed of, of olive tree, um, from what we understand. So it's a little bit more resistant to drought, and is not quite as impacted as some of the Spanish trees. And to, to add on a bit of context, I think that many people we speak to think that the supplies and the buying from these nations could be significantly higher than what we've seen in previous years. Naturally, as I mentioned, it's the sort of thing that we do see quite often, that this does happen, but if Spain keep producing low volumes, and again, you know, we don't know, we don't have a crystal ball, but it doesn't look very good for Spanish harvest, some saying, Roughly 700,000 metric tons maximum while it will be produced. They think the drawdown and it could continue effectively. And these nations could become very good outlets for the European market because what we understand talking to market players, the quality is actually very good. Some say comparable, even better than Spanish olive oil. Kyle Holland, uh, thank you so much for your expertise today. You are oil seeds and vegetable oils analyst at Mintech. We appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. 
And that's our show for this week. Do get in touch with us on X, formerly known as Twitter. At Vanier Cyril is my handle. Do use the hashtag AJCTC when you do, or drop us an email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. But there's more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That will take you straight to our page, which has individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. All right, that's it for this edition of Counting the Costs. I'm Cyril Vanier from the whole team here in Doha. Thank you for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.